What's going on everybody? JB here with another network knowledge quickie. Uh, today's video is about a useful framework for new engineers, uh, which I think will be helpful for folks that are trying to figure out how to securely build out IT environments. Uh, specifically for new people, it's kind of hard to have a good idea of what are some uh, best practices from a security perspective. And uh, I'm going to talk about a guide that's used by a lot of folks in the federal government, but something that uh, a lot of people who aren't necessarily in those environments might not even be aware exists. Okay, so before we start, there's two quick things that I want to mention. If this is your first time watching any of my content on the channel, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. And also don't forget to hit that bell icon so that way you get notified whenever I have any new content that comes out. The second thing is a new feature that we're going to be doing in all of these videos, where it's kind of like a pop quiz, if you will. It's a simple question at the beginning of the videos, and then once we get through the content in the video, then we'll go over the answer at the end. We're calling this quiz Network Knowledge Brain Gains. So this will be the first time that we've done one. Um, so we'll kind of walk through it here, and then uh, we'll go from there and hop into the content in the video. So for the first network knowledge brain gains question of the day, we have, can two computers in the same IP subnet talk to each other if they're on different VLANs and no ACLs are between them? So for example, you have 192.168.1.10 and a slash 24 in VLAN 10, and then 192.168.1.11 slash 24 in VLAN 20. So we have a few different multiple choice uh, answers that you can choose from here. Take a look at those and uh, put whatever you believe is the right answer in the comment section below. I'll be picking out uh, a winner from there to end up getting some uh, JBC swag stickers. So I'll give you a few seconds to take a look at this and then we'll move on to uh, our actual discussion today. First I want to give a shout out to Techie Kevin on Twitter at the underscore mystery underscore one who was uh, somewhat the motivation for putting together uh, this infographic and the uh, topic of this video. Um, so like I said in the intro, the, the main thing is uh, that a lot of new engineers don't really have a, a good starting point uh, of where to even go to look when it comes to building out secure information systems. So. There's a lot of different frameworks that are out there that can kind of provide uh, some level of guidance. And I thought uh, taking a look at NIST 853 and specifically looking at the different control families that are kind of more aligned with technical controls might be something that is useful for uh, new individuals. Now, for those who aren't aware, NIST 853 uh, also known as the Security Controls Traceability Matrix, is a document uh, that the federal government utilizes uh, to ensure compliance of new systems that are becoming active and going through some type of accreditation process. So the NIST 853 is made up of 18 different control families. And those range anywhere from things dealing with access control, user training, uh, maintenance, disaster recovery, um, physical uh, protections for uh, the IT environment. And each of those, in some ways, have some uh, variety uh, or varying level of applicability to the things that engineers are working on. So what I did was take the ones that really have a large amount of security configurations in them that kind of give some guidance as far as how you would actually want to build out the environment. Um, now, all of these control families all have policies and procedures that are written uh, to go along with them. But when it comes to actual implementation of specific technologies and configurations, um, they vary quite a bit. And so I wanted to just focus on the ones where really it was a heavy amount of 
uh, configurations and technologies that engineers would be looking at and that they would implement in their environments. So the five that I mainly focused on is access control, auditing and accountability, the identification and authentication, uh, systems and communication protection, and the system and information integrity. I'm going to put a link for the NIST 853 documentation uh, right here. So that should pop up in the video and you can go and you can take a look at the different control families and then all of the different controls that fall underneath each of those control families. So once you really dig into that, it kind of lays it out where under each control family, there's going to be a uh, whole list of different types of controls uh, and configurations that you would need to implement in order to be compliant from uh, a federal government approval perspective. Now, we're not talking about using this specifically to get any type of accreditation on any type of system. I'm using this more as a way to facilitate a conversation for folks who might not be aware of a good starting point when it comes to actually building out um, IT systems. So the access and control family um, really focuses mainly on things including configurations for logins. So things like login limits, failed logins, um, limiting uh, shared accounts, things like that. It also covers things dealing with sessions and session timeouts and how many sessions should be allowed going to certain types of devices, as well as wireless configurations and various types of account configurations. So next is the AU control, and, th and that deals with audit and accountability. But really, you can just think of this as a control that helps you define what you should be logging how often you should be logging it, where you should be logging it, and the types of protection mechanisms you're putting around that. Now remember, even though they're going to be giving you uh, a list of the types of events that they would want you to be auditing, um, that is not the be-all, end-all for that. There's always going to be unique types of event logging that you should be doing within your organization that's not covered in this. And then likewise, you could look at the list of events that they, they want you to be auditing, and some of them might not make sense depending upon your environment, the tools you have in place, the amount of storage that you have uh, to be able to handle all that. But it is a good starting guideline to go with. The third group I want to talk about is the identification and authentication control family. And really, this deals with everything that's kind of tied to AAA. Um, specifically with user accounts and authenticators. So AAA, remember, is stuff dealing with authentication, authorization, and accounting. So anything that's really dealing with authenticator management or identifier or service management, um, you can think of this control family as the oversight for management of passwords, usernames, uh, multi-factor authentication, things, things of that nature. The fourth group that I wanted to cover, which happens to be my favorite group, um, is the system and communications protection control family. And this deals with things such as isolation and segmentation, DNS, boundary protection, so firewalls, IDP, crypto type of things, so dealing with the different types of cryptographic protections that you implement in your environment, voice over IP, and a lot of other stuff falls into this control family. But definitely one of my favorite ones, one of the more technical ones, and really covers uh, a large amount of uh, systems and protections that you would need to implement in your environment. Now, the last group is the system and information integrity control family. And this deals primarily with flaw remediation, so things like patching. Um, it also deals with antivirus protection, spam protection, and other types of integrity and validation controls. So I think this is kind of a, a good starting point uh, for folks who want to dig into this a little bit more. I'm actually going to make a few more videos where I actually do deep dives into 
each of these different control families and we'll start to cover specific controls in, in there that might make sense for you to look at and be aware of to help you build out a more secure environment. So as I promised at the end of the video, we're now going to go back and look at the network knowledge brain gains question of the day and take a look at if we can figure out what the uh, correct answer is. Here. So last chance to put your answer down in the comments down below and we're going to review this right now. The question was, can two computers in the same IP subnet talk to each other if they are on different VLANs and no ACLs are between them? And the correct answer is C. No. And the reason is because you can't use the same IP subnet on different VLANs in the same Layer 3 device. So since you would need a router or Layer 3 device to talk between multiple VLANs when you would go to actually configure um, an IP address on both of the gateway IPs on that Layer 3 device, as soon as you go to create the, the second IP address on there, it would error out because you're already using that same subnet on a different interface. All right, once again, thanks for uh, watching the video. Make sure that you hit the like and subscribe and notification button, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right.